Okay, um, David Barnes is assistant director in the Civil Contingency Secretariat of the Cabinet Office. Um, the, we have quite long uh, bios and abstracts on the website, um, so you have access to all that information as well. I'll just very briefly tell you that in January this year, um, David joined the Civil Contingency Secretariat on a two-year secondment from the Metropolitan Police. He works within the Resilient Telecoms program, where he's completing a feasibility study into a civil national alert system, as well as working to improve the telecommunications capabilities with local resilience forum telecommunications subgroups. And anything else you want to <laughs> let them know about your work, David, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. So please um, welcome David Barnes um, as our first speaker this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Eve. Um, as was mentioned, I joined the Civil Contingency Secretariat in January um, from the Metropolitan Police, where I was involved in a um, kind of strategy and planning type roles. Um, so I uh, thought I'd come and give this a try and see what happens, see how it works out. Um, basically, the presentation I'm just going to take you through is just around some of the um, um, some of the work that we do within the Civil Contingency Secretariat, within the, uh, Civil Contingency Secretariat for those of you who, uh, who, who don't know what we do. Um, set out some of the general context for how we do resilience planning within the, uh, within the UK um, to just help you along with that. Um, Summarise some of the work we're doing around warning and informing. Um, this is one of the statutory duties that I'll explain um, on responders shortly. Um, also, obviously, some of the issues that we've got and guidance we, we issue around evacuation planning. Um, and then also some of the work I'm doing around resilient telecommunications and how that links in to the, um, to the whole piece. Um, just in the conclusion, I'm just going to obviously summarise why I think some of the emergency planning issues are actually quite a... Uh, um, sorry, I'll obviously the, the windows are quite loud, so I'll try and project my voice even more in a uh, police-type way. And hopefully that will be far better. So uh, here we go. OK. So the Civil Contingency Secretary itself um, was formed in 2001. Uh, there's always been a unit doing emergency planning type functions within central government. It was based within the Home Office, uh, the Ministry of the, uh, the, of the uh, Interior within the UK. Um, and following uh, some incidents back in 2001, where uh, those of you in the UK may well remember, we had a series of flooding, the foot and mouth issues, as well as the fuel disputes. Uh, it was recognised that perhaps the UK wasn't coordinating our response uh, to, to these emergency type situations as best as we possibly could. So that's why the Civil Contingency Secretariat was set up. We now sit within the Cabinet Office structure. Um, you may well have seen um, recently that since uh, the new government were elected, uh, they've appointed a National Security Advisor. CCS, Civil Contingency Secretariat, fit within the, the, that general um, hierarchy, as it were, structure within the Cabinet Office. So we report up to the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister. Um, that's where we sit in the whole hierarchy of things. Our general aim um, is to improve the UK's resilience, really, to, uh, to absorb, respond and recover from potential disruptions to everyday life. Um, we do this by short-term horizon scanning, so looking at what, what things could hit us um, or what things could occur over the next few weeks, um, looking at building capability across the UK on a national level to respond to these types of challenges and disruptions that can be caused, um, working with providers um, of what we call critical national infrastructure, together with the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, to look at how can we make sure that um, general life is as uh, resilient as possible with regards to communications, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on that shortly. Um, planning for the really big stuff, so if something massive does happen, um, that does need national coordination, then again, that's obviously our, our role and, and our responsibility to deal with that. Um, and again, dealing with it when it goes wrong. Uh, again, I'll come on to that a little bit more. Um, I'm just going to go through some of that. So the main basis for our work is the Civil Contingencies Act, which was enacted back in 2004. Um, it was one of the first tasks of the, um, of the Secretary Act to develop, this, uh, to develop the Act um, and really update some of the old, outdated emergency planning um, legislation that was, back, uh, that was in place from kind of the 1940s. So as you can imagine, there's been obviously a few changes to, to the world since the 1940s. So this was really to bring it up to date a lot more. It's been split into two parts, the Act. The first is around planning and preparations, and it's what I'll base the majority of my presentation on. Uh, the second part is around um, giving provision for government to make emergency powers if something catastrophic did happen to enable the government to make short-term 
uh, legislation uh, on, on the, not quite on the hoof, but obviously in quick time to enable uh, the response or the recovery to be as, uh, as efficient and effective as possible. Um, we've got a whole range of uh, statutory guidance um, and non-statutory guidance to sit alongside the Act, um, particularly one with regards to uh, evacuation planning, which I'll come on to. Um, and that's what we set out to help our responders where possible to develop the plans that they need to uh, in order to, to, to respond. The Act also goes as far as um, identifying those people who should respond to, uh, to an emergency and categorises these into two, well, two categories plus another. So category one, which is your, um, your core, really, emergency um, responders, includes uh, all the blue light services, so the fire and rescue service, the ambulances service and the police. Um, as well as uh, a whole range of other organisations, including local authorities, um, the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, who coordinate um, uh, sea rescues, um, and uh, a whole range of others as well. They have a range of duties uh, that, they need to, uh, that they need to conduct, as explained within the Act and the guidance, um, around making risk assessments of their local areas to understand where those risks or where those, perhaps where those disruptive challenges could occur. Um, a range for business continuity uh, purposes, get plans in place, so if these things were to happen, how could they still continue to provide the services that they need to to the public? Um, conduct actually planning around that as well to respond to those emergencies uh, and provide the, uh, provide the assistance and guidance to the public, as well as um, also maintaining uh, arrangements to warn and inform the public. So if the, when an emergency does happen, how do you get that message out? How do you alert the public to the thing that is happening and obviously giving the advice and the guidance that they need to to preserve themselves, their own lives and potentially property as well. Um, the second category it was surprisingly called Category 2 responders. Um, they're generally um, more kind of one step removed from the actual emergency response itself. It includes utility companies, telecommunications companies, um, uh, the gas board, the uh, national grid, those types of people who are, who are, who are um, required to make sure that we can still go about our daily business. Um, it also includes strategic health authorities, so regional health authorities, um, and the health and safety executive who have um, some uh, role with regards to some ha uh, hazardous sites, danger storage of uh, chemicals, etc. Uh, people that aren't specifically included within the guidance that stands at the moment or within the Act are people like the military. Uh, the re rationale for that is because we don't know if the military is actually going to be within the UK and able to deploy or commit the resources needed to help respond to those emergencies. So within the UK set up at the moment, within the UK framework, there is no um, provision or, I guess, um, expectation that one can rely on the military to come and give give support to the civil powers. However, there are arrangements in place to enable that if there is uh, resource and capability available. Um, one of the key points I've kind of put it at the bottom, uh, apt, is around this concept of subsidiarity. Uh, I can't even say it. <laughs> subsidiarity. It's not quite right either. But subsidiarity. Subsidiarity, that's the one. Thank you. Um, and this is really around um, trying to devolve as much of this power and decision making as possible to, to the local areas. We've got the map there of, uh, up on the right um, around how the, res how, these, um, uh, how the responders are organised. It's generally around police force boundaries um, within the UK, so uh, certainly within England and Wales that's 43, and I believe it's another further 8, I think, in Scotland, although I'm happy to be shot down and corrected on that if, that, uh, if that's uh, incorrect. Um, they form what we call local resilience forums. So it's all these category one, two responders coming together to cooperate and, uh, and share information with regards to emergency planning and emergency response. This is the concept that we try to base um, the planning around and what, what we call integrated emergency management. Kind of like a figure of eight type cycle and uh, bizarrely we start in the middle rather than at the top or the bottom just to keep you on your toes. So we actually start around that risk assessment section kind of towards the upper upper uh, right-hand quartile of the, uh, of the bottom circle. And this is about the risk assessment. As I mentioned um, earlier, this is, part of the, this is one of the key duties um, on responders and, uh, to assess the types of things that could happen within their area. Um, we also do this at a national level, and I'll come on to that as well as part of this, um, part of this discussion. Obviously, following on from that, there's something around setting on the objectives to determine what it is that we need to do, what planning or capacity building do we need to do to get in place to deal with those types of risks and those types of consequences that, 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 we, uh, that are explored. Obviously, moving on to that, it's around the action plan, getting the action plans in place, building up that capacity or doing those things, buying that equipment or those resources to deal with those types of emergencies that we are expecting to happen. 
We then go up to kind of agree and finalising that work plan to make sure that it's, uh, it's right and compatible across all of those partners, all of those organisations involved in that response to make sure that uh, um, some of those response, that, that all works over together. Once that's been agreed, we then go into the top, court, uh, the top circle around really issuing and dissemination of that plans and policy to make sure that people actually know what those plans are, what they're, what they're, they're ready to do, those types of things. Um, one of the key aspects then is around training and validating those issues. So once we've come up with some plans or, or some ideas as to how we're going to respond to these, what is it actually like when it, when it comes to testing it, when it comes to testing it in reality? Um, I think one of the sayings in the military that they always say is any good plan will fall apart on contact with the enemy. It's obviously one of those uh, um, figures of speech that you can plan, have a good plan, but as soon as you put up, come up against something, it will probably disintegrate. So it's how can you maintain that flexibility and uh, responsiveness to be able to adapt it to the scenario that you're particularly facing. And then we come around to reviewing and, and revising that. So actually, if we know that this particular plan needs uh, s s some area for developing, it's about how do we identify those lessons and move that back round into implementing those lessons so that actually we learn from those lessons rather than just identifying them, which is a uh, classic symptom. This is a, this is a copy from the um, National Risk Register. Um, it's available on, publicly on the internet, on the, uh, on the link there. I'm sure this will go up on the internet so you'll be able to access this yourself. Uh, this is an annual process that we go through within the CCS um, to really understand what the types of, uh, of threats and hazards that we face within the United Kingdom. Um, it's a bit of a classic uh, type risk type approach. So we've got impact across the, uh, going up the y-axis um, with, with likelihood probability across the uh, x-axis. Um, and there's uh, obviously definitions around how we, how we determine at what level they are. Um, the impact is, is around a whole variety of categories. So we look at obviously potential uh, loss of human life, um, potential damage to property, um, public outrage, if you can measure such a thing. So uh, obviously the views of the public, what do they expect to happen in those types of circumstances, as well as economic cost, both in terms of property and to the United Kingdom's economy overall. And likelihood um, is, a, is a combination of professional assessment as well as historical data as well. So we know, for example, um, how often flooding happens uh, within the UK, so we can base that on some of the other bits. Um, obviously, some of the attacks on transport, crowded places, obviously that's a bit more difficult, and we obviously work with colleagues uh, within uh, security services to uh, identify what the likelihood of those types of events are based on, obviously, ca current capabilities of, of potential terrorist groups. And obviously, as we recognised yesterday, the uh, memorial of the five-year anniversary of the uh, 7th of July, which I'm sure some of the other colleagues will uh, highlight. So, building capability and capacity. So, again, we're going through that cycle. This is around um, basically some of the action planning. I'll talk about uh, the work we do at a government, governmental level, but uh, I also appreciate this is also happening at different levels also below that, but just based on, uh, on the uh, information that I have. And uh, for speed, I'll just quickly go over this. What we try to look at, or what we try to encourage people to do, is looking at the generic capabilities that one would need to respond to these types of scenarios. So rather than going back to this idea of plans, um, we don't want them to be specific plans, we want them to be flexible. And it's about responding to those types of consequences that we know will happen. So if we know that if uh, flooding, for example, is going to cause people to evacuate, we also know there's other risks that will also perhaps need people to evacuate or move from their premises. So it's about looking at all those different risks and the consequences of those, and actually then gear, making, ourselves, making sure that we're geared up to handle that type of response rather than developing a specific pl evacuation plan, for example, for flooding, because that may not necessarily be or it's not necessarily a useful uh, or efficient use of people's time. We also do particular work um, around what we call high impact um, uh, issues. And we've got the, pick, the, the swine flu gentleman there from uh, the, the, the incident last year, which we've just uh, helped. Well, there's just been a uh, report published on that on the UK's response towards that. Uh, thank you very much for the sound effects for the, for the flu. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, these, are the types of, these are the types of scenarios that could have kind of going verging on catastrophic type consequences for the UK in terms of potential loss of life um, and dealing how do we deal with that number of, of fatalities. And we've also got issues around consistency as well. So how are we making sure that when we've got all these responding agencies, they're working uh, to the same 
um, to the same standards, to the same uh, processes, using the same types of equipment, so that if we do need to scale up those types of responses to be able to deal with something massive, people kind of know what they're doing. I'm sure uh, Dave Lindridge will uh, cover a lot of that off in his presentation later. So some of the key programs that we're running within CCS at the moment, uh, I mentioned around critical infrastructure. This is working, um, this covers very, a range of sectors within the UK, including health, um, water, reliability, communications, um, food, etc. And it's to make sure really that there's the infrastructure in place uh, and, and is stable and secure so that it can withstand the types of uh, impacts or what have you that are raised up in the National Risk Register. Um, we've, there's been lots of work uh, with the police around some of the security terrorism type threats here. Um, we're actually trying to do some more work to, um, to make sure that it actually can withstand some of the flooding type incidents that that photo tries to symbolise. Um, those of you who might remember the, uh, the floods in Gloucester, Tewkesbury uh, a few years ago, uh, the water was kind of this far from going over the sandbags and that would have caused uh, major issues with regards to power generation within the whole of the southwest. Uh, of the country. So it's kind of working, making sure that we can not only withstand some of the terrorism type uh, attacks, but also um, some of the natural hazards that, that we face as well. Going up to the top right, corporate resilience. Um, this is around making sure that organisations um, are as res responsive or, sorry, as resilient as they possibly can be. Uh, we've been involved with the British Standards Institute around defining BS2599, which that diagram is taken from. Um, and this is really a, a, a core standard around how resilient are people uh, or our organisations to, to um, these catastrophic events. Um, and then also, as you see there, the bottom picture around community resilience. So how can we better help people to look after themselves in these types of scenarios? Because as try as we might, the emergency services cannot be everywhere at once. So it's how can we get people to look after themselves and survive, survive for themselves in these types of scenarios. So coming on to the evacuation and shelter, um, I've got a copy of the, uh, the guidance. This is again available on the, uh, on the internet um, if you would like to see it. Um, I'm going to talk obviously a bit around this as that's the focus of, of some of the conversations today. Um, it's one of the 20 programs, uh, one of the 20 strands of work within the capabilities program that I alluded to uh, across government. Um, and it's basically con in, in its entirety is looking at three stages in reality. So there's the evacuation itself, getting people out of or away from whatever incident or hazard it is that's threatening them. How do you then shelter them, care for them, whilst they're not at their normal place of work or home? And then actually, how do you get those people back in to whatever that normal place is? So it's looking at that cycle in it, or that system in effect in its, in its entirety, rather than just getting the people out, because you also need to know where they're going to go, what, what attention do they need, um, and after that. The responders are uh, expected to develop a, a series of plans at the local levels, so again in response to the threats and hazards that, that they face with regards to developing both generic plans, so perhaps a city centre evacuation, uh, what the types of generic plans that one may need to, to do that within a general town centre in their area, or potentially site specific plans as well. So if there's particularly um, hazardous sites um, within that area, then again they're expected to develop specific plans to deal with any consequences that may arise from that. Um, some of that is um, statutorily uh, placed upon some organisations around what we call coma sites, um, which I believe stands for uh, control of major accidents or, and, and hazards. Um, and it's basically large petrochemical plants. Um, and there's also separate legislation around um, radioactive uh, and nuclear issues as well. So again, it's around making sure that we can deal with that. There's a whole complex issues around evacuation as well. So it's actually quite a big decision to make to move people out of an area because you might be exposing them to some of the risks that actually they may be better off staying inside. There's actually a whole piece there around determining when is it good to evacuate people and how can you do that in a phased and managed way. Um, and that's one of the major issues, I think, around the evacuation planning and how you can do that in a, in a safe and effective manner. Just quickly around the resilient telecoms, this is where my particular place of work is. Um, so during emergencies, it's pretty key to make sure that there's information flowing uh, all around that responder partnership or that local resilience forum or coordinating group as, as they're called in response terms. Um, we're rolling out bits of kit to try and help people to do that effectively and efficiently. Um, on the left hand side we've got what we're calling the resilience extranet. Um, this is effectively a, a secure online portal to enable all those people involved in developing plans to share those plans amongst one, one another 
Um, and this is classified up to a restricted level, so we can share some sensitive information on there about some of the constraints around or, or worries around um, obviously hacking and, uh, and, and those plans getting into the wrong hands. That's all accredited and that can be um, this, this uh, annual license type approach that we encourage responders to get online and share those plans together. Um, and also now looking at how we can use those in a live scenario as well. So how can we use that to share information across the different responders to make sure that, for example, if we are evacuating people, do we know what the capacity is of that rest centre? How many people are there there already? Uh, what kind of capabilities does it have with regards to uh, medical care or uh, dis disabled access, um, as well as um, general stuff like uh, toilets, showers, food, that type of thing. Uh, Hits to picture a satellite dish there, probably gives that away. This is around, uh, it stands for the High uh, Intensity Telecommunication System. Uh, this is a replacement of a wired system basically to enable uh, government and centres in each of the what we call local resilience forums uh, to maintain contact with one another. So this is on those high impact uh, type risks which could knock out uh, standard communications uh, systems to enable that coordination to still happen um, across between government and between some of the areas. And also, as, as was alluded to, uh, telecom subgroups. And this is around uh, local groups trying to set up local plans uh, with regards to um, uh, what should happen if these various communications elements are knocked out, how can they still commu communicate with one another. And again, I'm sure uh, Dave will talk a little bit more about that in his presentation later. And the, the third area of work I'm just going to highlight is around the warning and informing section, because again, I think that links in to what the uh, presentation or what the seminar today is uh, discussing. Um, as I've already alluded to, uh, this is a statutory duty on, on those responding agencies, certainly those Category 1 responding agencies, to be able to put that information out to um, members of the public so that they can help to look after themselves as well as keep themselves safe. Uh, we've got a couple of pictures here as well just to go through. Um, there's a whole variety of... Um, ways in which we can get that mess those messages out already that were already uh, in existence. Um, the classic, uh, the top left there is the go in, stay in, tune in message. This is our call message that we try to, um, that we're trying to get out as a gen generic response to an incident. So it's kind of a get inside, stay inside and tune in to local radio or television stations. This is trying to get people out from outside into somewhere that's safe. Um, obviously we're trying to uh, make that a ri slightly richer in terms of keep away from windows, um, keep below, um, think about high ground or low ground depending upon what the, what the incident is and what the context is. But that's uh, our general response message is just go in, stay in, tune in. Once you've got away from an incident, to get inside a building and stay inside there until you could be told otherwise by some of the emergency services to come and rescue you. Um, obviously that might well depend in, uh, on the particular context and, and where you are in relation to that. Um, as we go through. Some of the other um, methods that we can use to communicate with people, we've got a picture there of a uh, uh, police officer speaking through a loud hailer. Um, it's a pretty simple but nevertheless effective tool in trying to coerce people into getting, going them, getting them to go into a specific direction. Um, it works, um, but it obviously can be quite resource intensive because that police officer could be doing something else. So it's also making that balance between um, what's the best use of people and getting that best way to get that message out. We've also, there's also arrangements in place, um, both at a national and, and also local levels, with the, particularly the BBC and other uh, media um, partners around getting messages out in times of emergency. Uh, there's a specific section on the um, BBC website called Connecting in a Crisis, uh, which you may look, like to look up, um, and that basically uh, sets out some of the responsibilities and what the BBC will do in some of these um, instances, and then some of the local responders develop plans to make sure that those links are there in place to the local radio stations and television stations, what have you. In the top right there, I've got a, so sorry, it's a very poor screenshot, but it's the, um, uh, the Environment Agency's Flood Warnings Direct System. Uh, this is as close as we get really to a, to a national warning capability within the UK as it stands at the moment. Um, this is managed and administered by the Environment Agency and, and uh, basically pumps out warning messages if you're at risk of being flooded out. Um, it's got a whole series of, uh, of risk uh, pre-identified risk areas um, to uh, load up and should, should there be some forecasting, which, which they do now on a routine basis, uh, to identify that those places could well flood, then you'll get an automated telephone recorded message through to your landline um, to inform you that you may well be flooded and you might want to consider evacuating. Um, you can also sign up for additional uh, messaging around email, SMS, 
messages um, as well, and as, as well as their internet sign, which obviously they keep updated as well. The bottom right uh, slide is an example of where some of our, uh, some of our resilience forums have um, got together to uh, develop uh, what they've called Birmingham Community Alert. Um, and again, this is similar to the Environment Agency uh, approach where you can go online, yeah. sign up, register your details to receive um, issues or receive news of incidents within that area with some advice about getting out or staying put or what have you. Um, so that's what, some example of what some of the responders are doing as well. Some of the work I'm also looking at within my work at the moment is a particular area around what we're calling cell broadcast. Um, this is um, a particular tool within the uh, mobile phone network um, to message people within a defined geographic area. Uh, we're working quite closely on this with colleagues from the Netherlands um, who are rolling this out at the moment uh, with the view for that to be operational by the end of this year um, and will enable them to send out text type messages to people in predefined areas should they need to alert them to particular instances going out. If we think back round to the cycle, this is obviously the, uh, this is where it all kind of comes to, to, to fruition as it were or, or not. This is about responding and exercising to those particular events. Again, part of this exercising thing is around checking the effectiveness of those plans. How well do they work? Making sure that people are familiar with them. It's um, one thing to have people in a room developing these plans, but actually getting them to the instant commanders and those people who will be managing those situations on the ground is, is a different issue entirely. And this is about how can we make sure that that familiarisation and understanding and knowledge obviously gets rolled out to those people who, who will need to do so in, a, in an event. And again, also to allow us to identify improvements. Uh, this again is just a screenshot of the London Resilience uh, website, uh, identifying some of the exercises and what have you that they are, that they are doing. Um, again, that's if you're interested. And the bottom bit um, is around uh, national crisis management and national coordination. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Cabinet Office briefing rooms. Uh, you might well have heard COBRA. Uh, that's a picture of what it looks like. It's a pretty boring meeting room with a video screen behind it. But that's, that's where, uh, if there's a national emergency, that's where... Uh, ministers and senior officials will meet to discuss the response um, and recovery from that. Um, CCS has a key role in providing support to those meetings uh, if, if they are called, particularly in regards to non-terrorist non related issues, we will be providing all the support to that. Uh, recently, for example, uh, the ash cloud, volcanic ash cloud, uh, we again, CCS supported that um, through uh, administration support, etc. So conclusion, why do I think emergency planning is complex? As I've tried to get across, this is all around local people doing local things and trying to respond and develop plans to deal with the situations that they have locally, um, which is good for effectiveness but can cause issues when you start to scale up those types of responses. If you've got a, a large-scale uh, issue, how do you make sure those different organisations, which are then even multiplied because of the size of the, of the hazard or the incident, becomes even more difficult? Um, and I would suggest that's probably not an, that's a non-linear relationship. <laughs> Based around some of the uh, risk analysis and assessment, we're never truly sure, really, what's actually going to happen. Um, obviously, this, as, we've, as Eve highlighted, you, you can't set these things up. You don't know how big or small they're going to be or um, what, what the specific scenario is going to happen. Um, so you can never quite be sure what's happening. So it's about keeping things generic um, and flexible wherever possible. The number of stakeholders and experts all around this sphere is, is pretty large. Um, a lot of people have, obviously, their own views as to how this should be done. And it's about how can we blend that into some kind of consensus to move forward and enable us to plan. Um, and then also the kind of the connectivity between some of the emergency responders. Um, and this is again across that whole realm, linking to the stakeholder uh, issues, makes that incredibly difficult uh, um, when these things happen. And then of course, there's the, un uh, the unpredictability of what, uh, how the actual public will respond to the situation. Um, there's obviously a variety of research uh, literature around that particular area. Um, it seems that the general, the general approach is that the public don't tend to panic uh, in these types of scenarios. Sometimes they're just um, kind of shocked to the extent that they don't know what they're doing and can be walking around affecting zombies. And you can also get those kind of traditional leaders who will also take charge and uh, help, um, help secure people in that way. But there's a kind of a whole variety of the way, differences in the way in which the public will respond. And that really is it for me, I think. Um, I guess I'm happy to take any questions of my contact details. I've got cards as well. Um, if you prefer, I can give out as well. I hope you found that useful and interesting, but as I say, I was hopefully trying to set some of the context of how we uh, plan for resilience in the UK and how that all works. That's great. Thank you very much.
much indeed. Okay, we've got um, um, a few minutes for um, questions. And um, while you're thinking of your comments or questions, I'd like to pick up perhaps one or two elements. Because I think you kept mentioning how important it is to have that resilience and that response and that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, is part of what I think complexity helps us to understand. Because as you are adapting to changes, yeah. The very act of adaptation, the very actions you're taking, are going to affect others. They're going to change their behavior. Yep. And that change behavior will come back and affect you. So it's a very dynamic process here, which we call co-evolution. I think understanding these dynamics is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Whether it's between the different responders, whether it's between the public, or whether, you know, whatever the different um, the, the, the response might be. And I think this is one of the things that actually the theory can be very practical mm -hmm. in helping us to um, understand. Okay, I'll pick things up as well. So I hope you've had time to consider any points and questions. Yes. Can you please say who you are, where you're from, and then a short question or comment. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vinegupta uh, Hex Yurt Project, which is a mass sheltering initiative. Oh, hey. oh sorry, a uh, Vinegupta Hex Yurt Project, which is a mass sheltering initiative uh, using open source. Uh, the um, parcel messaging uh, stuff, being able to send uh, messages within specific cells. Yes. Could you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, I can do. Um, so, Sol Broadcast itself, as I say, is based around uh, the makeup of the mobile phone networks. Um, you can obviously see all the towers around. Uh, what tends to happen? Uh, is there a uh, pen I could use? It's easier to oh, draw yes, out. Yeah. Okay. When you when you um, when, when you see maps of these types of things, you often see them drawn in in hexagons rather than circles. That's because of the properties of the way the we, the way the mobile networks operate. Uh, what you don't have, in effect, is your mast in the middle broadcasting out. You actually have them at the corners broadcasting in to the, into the different faces. So if you think if you have a number of uh, masts around the, the, the shape all broadcasting in, you can effectively send a message to that particular area. The size of that area depends um, effectively on where you are. In London, obviously a highly dense population, uh, there's a lot of masts around to deal with that type of, or, or the extent of uh, messages that would, sorry, the amount of handsets that would be in that area at one point. Obviously in more rural locations, less demand, therefore the, the, uh, the masts are further spaced apart, your cells are far bigger. So there is... Which is the kind of sort of what you would want. Yes, you would expect, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's kind of how it works, uh, just in, in this, very simply. Uh, we've been involved, to say, with, in the work in the Netherlands, um, around trying to understand the work that they're doing, how that works. Um, we've been working with some of the mobile phone industry to uh, start to specify standards so that handsets would react, react in a certain way, um, that it can get kind of uh, common um, technology platforms so that, again, it's obviously easier to, to buy all that type of solution in. So that's some of the types of work that we're looking at at the moment. As I say, it's the whole, uh, Netherlands are far more advanced in that than we are, and we're kind of watching to see how that works with them. They've done a whole range of tests and trials around its effectiveness, which suggests it's, it's definitely worth following. Yeah, I have a question. I wonder to what extent you use large-scale computer simulation to try to investigate the, uh, the impact of emergencies. Very good question. And uh, it's probably something that would be... We would probably... Because the majority of the plans are developed at a local level, we don't do a lot of the major planning. We only do it for these kind of... For, say, within the CCS, when you do it at those catastrophic-type levels. Um, and... It's around building on or scaling up uh, the types of processes and standards that, that they operate within their day-to-day -day business. Uh, one of the things that uh, we found out, particularly around telecommunications stuff, 
is around that if you roll out lots of new kit to people for use in emergencies, and then it gets to the emergency, no one knows how to use the kit because they never use it. So it's around how can we build up those processes that they already have to respond to those major instances. Uh, with regards to computer simulation, um, I would suggest minimal. Um, I think that's partly because of the, uh, the need to develop generic plans um, and how generic can we make those models um, to respond to, for example, a town centre evacuation. But on the other hand, there is some of the site-specific plans where perhaps it might be more easily applied. I don't know, I guess I, I put that back to you as experts in that field. Yes. To, uh, I, th I think that may be something that we need to discuss in much greater depth um, later on today because uh, it, it could well be that um, there could be quite a lot of benefit in, in exploring yeah. that issue yeah. a, a lot more. Right. Um, Jeff, you didn't say who you are, so I'll say uh, Professor Jeff Johnson from Open University. Now, there was a, a gentleman over there. Please say who you are and where you're from. Hi. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Chris Cocking, London Metropolitan University. I'm a psychologist who looks at crowd behaviour in emergencies, so I was particularly interested um, and I'm encouraged by your sort of awareness that in large emergencies, panic isn't generally the... Um, the sort of normal response. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite encouraged by that because that's the evidence that we've found. I'd like to add something as well to the idea of unpredictability of behaviour. Clearly it's an issue that we have as planning for large scale responses you can never completely identify everyone's behaviour but I think we can be slightly more optimistic that if you create certain behavioural norms you can encourage more pro-social than anti-social behaviours and as is rightly pointed out it's also a dynamic process so a particular example I thought was in the um, fuel crisis uh -huh. the um, when it was presented as panic buying, that was what actually caused the pumps to run dry. And rather than yeah. the actual amount, the people that, that thought there was going to be a shortage, so they went and filled up their tanks. Something we've had discussions with the media about this, that maybe it shouldn't be presented as people are going out and panic buying, because then people are encouraged to compete with each other, going, well, I'm going to have to fill up because I'm not going to be able to get it. And we've got some journalists to agree that in future emergencies they will not use the term panic buying because it mm -hmm. encourages competition. So if we look at norms that can encourage more cooperation and less competition, I think we might be able to um, ha have a better idea of predicting behaviour or creating norms in which the majority of people are more likely to behave in rather than less in ways that we would like them to be yeah. more cooperative. Now, I saw Kate's hand up, so why don't you pass on to her? She's also a psychologist. I thought we'd take the two okay. together and then... Thank you. Um, uh, Kate Hopkinson, Inner Skills Consultancy. Um, I am also a psychologist and I'm very interested in what you have to say about the, the human factors. Yep. Um, I particularly wondered whether you could tell us a little bit more. You mentioned that uh, there's, uh, there tends to be a gap between the plan as conceived yep. and communicating that and actually getting responders up to speed and to cooperate and be consistent about mm -hmm. actually implementing the plan. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what what gets in the way and how yeah. you um, plan for that if you do. Yeah, um, I think maybe this will come out throughout the day. We've got obviously a variety of different presenters from different organisations and maybe that will come out as well. Um, I, th I, think there's, I think it's something, something around the organisational cultures of, of, of the different responding agencies and sometimes they can clash against one another um, and it's about how can we deal with that and iron some of those types of issues out because people do things in very different ways. Um, and for, some, for example, uh, local authorities can often get um, uh, told that they're being slow in, in developing plans or responding to something. And that's because actually it's a very different pro way of doing things in local authority than it is within a police service where you're running after things or even responding to, to emergencies on a day-by-day -day basis. So I think that because there's differences in the way people do things on a, on a daily basis, I think con uh, help complicate those types of relationships. Um, I think that's probably the, the, the major point of that. Uh, with regards to some of the kind of predictability of the public uh, points, um, yeah, I, 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 I guess I, I do agree with you, and particularly uh, some of the things that we try to do within our press releases is about trying to refute some of those messages that, that perhaps are coming up. Um, but there's always difficulty, and uh, um, public can be mistrusting of government messages in those types of scenarios. Um, so, as you say, it's perhaps about how can we work with the media to make sure that those messages are the best for the general community rather than actually peddling government um, kind of uh, policy or what have you. So it's, it's kind of trying to find that balance, I think, um, which is a particular challenge around all public sector work with the media, I think. <laughs>
Now, I've got three questions, and I will ask for the three to be taken together because okay. we've got five minutes before the next yep. presentation. But those of you who have other questions, please make sure that you keep them because at the end of the day, I hope all the speakers will um, stay to join us on the panel so that we can actually discuss much more freely um, uh, the, the, the different issues. I'm Maggie Ellis. I'm part of the Sociological Project at LSE. And in the past, I've been part of the Royal London Hospital Helicopter Committee, so I have direct uh -huh. um, experience at dealing with uh, response to contingencies and planning training for staff for that. Um, one of the things which I'm constantly reminding my colleagues within Sociological and everybody else who I meet is that 40% plus of the population maybe older or disabled people. We know that very bad things happened in New Orleans when yeah. there was a major contingency. And it would be good if you could just run us through one or two points about how you believe we're carrying and planning here in a better way. Okay. Thank you. I'm Saeed Ashu, uh, regeneration consultant at Liverpool University Associate. Within the major disaster, I think maybe we could discuss it later on, but I'll just mention it. There is two uh, scenarios or two lessons could be learned, which is currently the BP Gulf of Mexico, yes? There yep. are health and safety issues and uh, faults assessment and risk impact. Also, the economic uh, risk impact on the British economy are part of the BP, because currently the uh, dividend or the... Uh, from the shareholders has been suspended and the yeah. and these are quite good scenarios. I know the cabinet is not involved but it has a good learning lesson and there is a previous incident where the uh, North Sea oil disaster and I think South Essex the uh, oil uh, storage terminals but we could discuss this at uh, maybe at you know yeah uh, later on because it is a good uh, modeling and simulation and lesson to be and it's still dynamic it's still the process mm -hmm. is being mm -hmm. ongoing thank you mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Arundel from London Borough of Redbridge, one of the local authority um, emergency planning coordinator. Um, firstly, in respect to Jeff's question about um, computer modelling, I recently did some modelling with a tape measure, um, a piece of squared A4 paper and a pencil and worked out the uh, evacuation strategy for uh, an event we had in our town centre. So that was the extent of our computer modelling, a lead pencil. Um, I think one of the, the thing, key challenges that local authorities have, and perhaps you could comment on this, is the um, Category 2 responders have a responsibility to share information with Category 1 responders. And often one of the challenges, picking up on some of the other themes, is the um, cultural challenges between the local authority requesting information mm -hmm. from a Category 2. And perhaps you might comment on how you feel we could overcome some of those challenges. I, I've recently made information requests of utility companies and just been stonewalled in terms of administrative procedure. Yeah. And that's very challenging because I want to be dynamic to make decisions and plan. And that, yeah. that relationship is very hard because we're coming from different mindsets. And I'm interested in, interested in, in your, yeah. your thoughts on that. I'm sure our ambulance service colleagues have had yeah. similar problems with crowded places and yeah. um, large structures like that. Okay. Thank you. I think if I actually take the first and third questions together, and I'll come back to the second one, because I think they're both around the same issue around how do we share information, uh, albeit between perhaps different parties. First one, particularly around vulnerable people. Uh, within, the, uh, within the guidance document, model it again, uh, there is a section in there regarding um, vulnerable people and actually we also, there's a subsequent publication as well around identifying vulnerable people and making plans around those. Um, there's obviously issues regarding uh, Data Protection Act is, is the major kind of barrier that people perceive to stop them from sharing that type of information um, and there's, there's bits and pieces around that that we can, uh, we can do and we've obviously had conversations with uh, Treasury solicitors with regards to that and how that reacts or um, how that interfaces I guess around this particular area. And I say some of the um, conclusions of that are drawn into that um, data sharing guidance that, that we've got. Um, I guess again with the category two, as you say, it's, it's a similar type, similar type point. Um, one, of the, one of the duties or, or the only duties on category two responders really are to cooperate with emergency planning and to share information. The extent to which that, that can be done, again, can, can vary depending upon uh, some commercial sensitivities 
um, and others, um, but I agree with you in that we need to look at how we can involve that type or, or get that type of information on a, on a better footing. Um, there's been some, some interesting solutions around that. I know London itself has a utilities group uh, at, the, uh, um, at a kind of regional level to bring in utility providers across a range uh, of things to try and ma ma uh, manage some of the information requests that they get um, and respond to those as best as we can do. And it's about how can we make sure that those types of um, structures that we have kind of set up, are they working as best as they can do? I agree with that. Um, the other point around um, economic consequences of contingencies, I think, yeah, I think you're, you're right in how can we better understand that. Um, as I talked about in the National Risk Register, one of the categories that we assess impact on is economic impact. Um, the, how that, that data is, uh, or, or how that information is provided, I guess, is, is as with all models, is open to uh, some discussion and debate. Um, but there's certainly, I well, we agree with you, that's perhaps an avenue where uh, we could look at understanding impact of, of events. At that point, I think we need to um, finish. And thank you very, very much. Thank you.